Welcome back to Quantum Crosstalk. I'm Olivia and this is Abby. And this is the series where we sit down with influential members of the IBM Quantum community to ask what they're up to and discuss some new interesting releases and product features. Today, we are going to be talking to Jesse Yu, a product manager at IBM Quantum. And we are going to be talking about all things Qiskit runtime, primitives, execution modes. It's gonna be a great conversation. And without further ado, here's Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Welcome to our Crosstalk episode three. Thank you so much for coming down into the city and hanging out with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, do you want to start with maybe just um, an introduction? Sure. So my name is Jesse Yu. Um, I am the product manager for Kiskit Runtime here at IBM Quantum. Um, I joined IBM in 2005. I started out as a software developer for the our mainframe division, actually. Um, my background is in classical software development. So I have a bachelor's and master's both in computer science with a concentration on system software. Um, I joined IBM Quantum in 2018. Um, and I also started out as a, a developer for IBM Quantum for, uh, originally on the backend system. And I switched to doing development for Qiskit. And about two years ago, I joined the product team for Qiskit Runtime. Mm. You've been all over the place then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it has been a journey. I'm particularly interested in your journey because I also come from a more kind of classical software background mm -hmm. and then kind of kind of found out about this quantum thing and somehow ended up here. Um, but generally, how have you felt about the transition from classical to quantum? So it's been it's a very interesting transition. It was definitely a, a huge cultural shock when I first made a transition, not just because it's a transition from classical to quantum. But as I mentioned, my background is also in the mainframe which is probably our oldest business in, here <laughs> on IBM. And Quantum on the other side is it's the newest. The newest. <laughs> newest, exactly. So there was a huge difference. Um, so while there is a lot of classical software development still in IBM Quantum, but obviously the whole, um, the, the technology itself is different. One thing that I was really, it, it was a little bit difficult for me when I started is that in classical world, if you have a question, even if it's a newish technology, you can easily Google it and usually find a nice summarized mm -hmm. uh, paragraph. Tell Are you, you telling me you can't Google all of the answers <laughs> for quantum computing? So quantum computing, when you Google it, it gives you like 10 different research papers you have to read. <laughs> so that was, that was definitely a bit difficult. Um, and also the the, customer requirements are also very different. For example, like in the, the mainframe world, where people focus, you know, care more about the stability and like the security, that kind of things of the product. And here in quantum, people tend to want the, the latest and the greatest, even if that means they have to update their, their code more often. Plus, you probably had to get used to working with all those physicists. Which... <laughs> That's actually the best part, working with all the physicists who understand the secrets of the universe makes me feel smart. <laughs> I'm glad you have such high opinions of us. <laughs> All right, let's uh, start off with our first main question of um, the show today. So you um, are heavily involved in the development of Qiskit Runtime. Um, so first question is just, what is Qiskit Runtime? Can you give us um, like a summary? Sure, sure. So um, runtime typically means the execution environment in which you can run your uh, a program. For example, um, you all use web browsers before. If you're just writing the URL on a paper, nothing happens. But <laughs> when you put in your URL in the browser, you hit enter, it loads the page. So the browser is kind of like the execution environment. That is the runtime environment that for is the, runtime the environment. website that you're trying the, to access. Exactly, exactly, for the request that you made, so you get results back. So Qiskit Runtime originated um, as a similar idea. It's like this execution environment for your quantum program, for your Qiskit program. And it was um, created so that it's co-located next to the, the uh, quantum processor that we have. So things are much faster if there's any iterative um, processing. So actually, just going off of that, one thing that I'm interested to learn from you is what is it about writing a quantum program and just like sending it to a quantum computer, just I guess running it over the cloud. We always say, oh, we just put it on the cloud and we make it seem like this nebulous, you know, far off thing that works 100% of the time, um, but it's super easy to understand. What are the complexities that go into actually being able to have a quantum cloud infrastructure? Sure, so yeah, so from the user's point of view, our goal is of course, so that you can just write your program and you hit send and it works. 
but like you said, there's a lot of complexity behind. Uh, the program that you write, for example, in Qiskit, it needs to be packaged up. First of all, packaged up so it can be sent to this remote server. And in the remote server, it has to be unpacked so we can do like things like validation. And um, more importantly, we have to do compilation. And that's the same thing with classical software that you, you, you write your program in a higher level language, but it needs to be compiled into the bytecodes that the Q, uh, CPU understands. Mm -hmm. So the same for the quantum pro uh, program has to be compiled and then loaded into all the control uh, electronics that emits all these microwave pulses to actually stimulate the qubits. And that's how we do cal uh, calculation. And re uh, on, the out on the way back, all the output from the actual quantum computer it needs to be classified into the zeros and ones because the quantum computer doesn't just tell you zeros <laughs> and ones. So that needs to happen, and then some post processing needs to happen. If you are using um, if you are using primitives, then sometimes there are post processing like the error mediation that also needs to happen before all that gets packaged back and then sent back to your laptop. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a great segue. Um, on to my next question. Uh, what does Qiskit runtime essentially have to do with the primitives themselves? So Qiskit runtime was introduced three years ago, give or take. And it was originally introduced to execute arbitrary code. So you write your program, you upload it to our runtime environment, and you run it in the, in the runtime environment. Um, and that was to reduce the latency. So if you are use, doing like iterative um, uh, algorithms, it reduces the latency for each iteration. It doesn't have to go from your laptop to the quantum computer and then back. Um, but that was also back when when we, we only had like 64 qubit machines. Mm -hmm. so only 64 qubits. I know, only 64. <laughs> for, let's, you know, small scale. Oh, that's <laughs> so 2021. <laughs> exactly. So like when things only run few, for a few seconds, then that one extra uh, two or three second latency overhead is a lot. Mm -hmm. But now we're at the utility scale. Then when you're, you know, with error mitigation, your program can run for hours. So people don't usually care about that few seconds extra. Uh, so and therefore we've kind of simplified the execution environment to just run the primitives uh, instead of arbitrary code. And also running arbitrary code kind of also um, constrains your program to only use the classical resources that's available on our uh, in the execution environment. So primitives. <laughs> so the the tumor the primitives are basically the most common queries people make to a quantum computer. Um, we have the sampler and the estimator. The sampler gives you the the distribution of the simple simple results, and the estimator gives you the expectation values. Um, and Kiski runtime, instead of just executing arbitrary uh, code that's not scalable, we are just giving you the more powerful um, tools of you doing these uh, primitives. And there's actually, the, the primitives themselves are kind of a broader definition. There's, you know, there's a runtime implementation of the primitives. There's the original Qiskit implementation. There's like the Qiskit Air primitives as well. Maybe can, you can explain to us a little bit of the, the difference between all those different primitives that are out there. Sure. So the primitives is really uh, just an interface. It's kind of like a browser. Let's they all support loading, you putting in URL and give you a page. But some browser like Firefox, they may have more advanced features like the VPN mode. Um, so that's kind of the same as primitives. The, the actual interface is, is defined in the Qiskit SDK itself. And there is a local implementation uh, in Qiskit um, that uses the local state vector simulator. The AIR primitive uses the same interface, but it uses the, the AIR simulator itself. And Qiskit runtime, our primitives run on real uh, quantum computers. And we have more feature because unlike the simulators I mentioned before. <laughs> You're real, using a real device. <laughs> we're using a real device, which uh, is noisy. So <laughs> because the results are now noisy, we also provide error mitigation. So you can get results that are closer to the, the, the correct ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe another clarification question for me. So around the time where we started introducing these other forms of the primitives, we also started introducing different runtime execution modes. Um, and I've always been a little bit confused about the different types of execution modes. So there are jobs, sessions, there's the batch mode. Can you talk to me about what all of those different modes are? Sure, sure. So job mode, job execution mode is our oldest and original mode. 
and that is that when you make a job is basically a representation of a query you make to the quantum, the, the quantum processor. And this query can typically you would have one or more circuits in your job. Mm -hmm. um, and because of because quantum computers obviously are very expensive and scarce resources, your job typically has to stay in the queue, unlike you know the browser where you got your answers back and forth. It's seconds. not as instant, just like exactly. right yeah, after yeah, computer, yeah. get me the yeah. results. You have to right. wait with everyone else who also everyone wants to access else. the device. <laughs> yeah, and I think the longest I've seen is two weeks. You have to wait two weeks in the queue before you get your results back. So that is not very useful in a lot of cases. So in Three years ago, maybe we introduced sessions. So sessions was um, very useful for things like um, um, variational algorithms, where you have to do this iterative uh, yeah. query from your between your classical your laptop and the the quantum processor. And if every iteration takes weeks, then your algorithm is gonna take forever. Um, so sessions was very um, very useful for that. It's also very useful if you have uh, time sensitive. Uh, inquiries, like if you're building a noise model, mm -hmm. and two weeks later, it's not going to be useful anymore. Right. So that's when we introduced session. And then last year, we also introduced batch. Batch kind of sits in between these two. So um, while our quantum processors can still only process one job at a time, the classical piece of this processing, as I mentioned before, compilation, for example, they can be paralyzed. And that's where batch comes in. So instead of sending, sending in one job with you know a million circuits, which will not run because we're not going to let you hog the processes <laughs> for a million circuits anyway, you can then divide that into smaller jobs. And then the classical piece, processing piece of those jobs will run in parallel to, and then that kind of speeds up your entire workload. So how do I know, if I'm a user, um, whether I should set up a session or a batch? Sure. So session. A lot of times, a session um, is useful for like if your if your query is time sensitive and you really want to make sure it runs within like the the jobs um, run within the same amount of time. So if I'm studying noise, for example, exactly, I need a session because right. noise will fluctuate over time. Right, right. Or if you are doing iterative, where you have to get the results back, you cannot like all the the jobs are dependent on each other. Yeah, so you have to wait to get a result right. and then make your next job based on that. Right. The result you got. The okay. result of a previous job. So sessions are good for that. And for batch, it's really when the jobs don't have dependency on each other. You just want to take advantage of that parallelism. OK, got it. We are also uh, in the process of updating our documentation <laughs> to give you, you know, more details about when to choose what and some best practices. Yeah, okay. so if you folks at home, if any of that went over your head, check out the links in the description. We'll leave you the docs for all of those things. Um, so there were also some updates recently to batch and soon sessions, right? Can you talk to me a little bit about what the improvements are going to be? Sure. So the batch, the update to batch uh, was just re released recently. So it is really to tighten up the, the batch execution mode so that there is no delay in between each job just to make the batch more uh, efficient. And the updates to session um, the big, biggest change is that you really do have exclusive exclusive access to the QPU during the session active window, so that not even system calibration will run during that period. Um, and also, there are some changes to billing, just to incentivize people to uh, use sessions more efficiently. Got it. Cool. How is the idea generally of like doing quantum on the cloud evolved over the years? And how have the execution modes kind of reflected that change? There are a, a few changes. One is when when I joined Quantum, the, the our service was very much used just by researchers. So what they care about is low level access, and they don't want their circuits changed. They want um, their input to just go straight to the, the processor, the, the QPU, and get their outputs back. But over the years, there are um, people who are not necessarily quantum physicists who are who started using quantum computers as a tool, especially since we published our utility paper. And while they care more about are the higher level outputs, so like the expectation values. Um, and they also don't really want to do like all the, they don't want to handcraft their circuits mm -hmm. anymore. They just want to get the best results possible with the technologies we have to I offer. I guess, would it be fair to say that you know, the, the people that are using the devices these days are, it's almost moving more and more towards 
how you would expect like a regular computer or supercomputer to work and be accessed through the cloud. And so people are coming to quantum like with already that experience and those assumptions. Exactly, exactly, because so that's kind of the next set of users we want to target, what we call the quantum computational scientists, yeah. who have domain knowledge about their specific uh, sector, but not necessarily have deep understanding of how quantum computers work. And we want to make that use, and we want to make that user experience kind of as analogous as to what you would have done as a as a classical computational. Yeah, it's very athlete. close now to the interface that you would have if you were using like a supercomputing center, which makes sense because as we move towards the HPC era, <laughs> then the interface will be yeah, like you said, much smoother. So speaking of new updates to uh, Qiskit Runtime, I know recently as well there was the release of this local testing mode feature. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So um, of course, as I mentioned before, that uh, quantum computers are very expensive and scarce resources. So for most people, when they first write a program, they would uh, run it in a, on a simulator before sending off to a real backend. Um, and the local testing mode is the idea so that you can write the same code with the same syntax as if you were running on a, a real backend, but just change one line of code and have it run on the simulator. And we also have plans to support additional um, simulation tools. For example, um, Kiske Air already has this, um, what we call the Clever simulation mode, that can very efficiently simulate large number of circuits. And we want to add other tools so you can convert, easily convert your circuits into Clifford circuits. Related to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the complexities that go into running a quantum program remotely. Because although you know a, a user doesn't necessarily have to think about all the nuts and bolts that go in when they press Shift Enter and send a quantum job off to the cloud, we know that the actual infrastructure is pretty complicated. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, going from your local laptop, your Qiskit environment, the code that you write, the uh, Python representation of your circuits needs to be packaged up so, you can so it can be sent through the wire to our remote service. And over there, there are a number, long number of uh, steps that need to be involved. The first one is scheduling, because you know it's scarce in resources. People have to wait in line, yeah. and who gets to run next needs to be uh, determined. There is validation. We want to make sure that your code is actually val uh, valid, so that it doesn't you know, waste any uh, resources in the back end. Then there is um, any preprocessing that may need to be done if you're using kissing runtime primitives with tooling, for example, or dynamical decoupling. There are preprocessing that needs to be done. And the code then needs to be compiled into something that the, the QPU actually understands. Then all that the compiled pulses need to be loaded into our control electronics, which then actually tells the, the qubits what to do. Yep. And on the way back, the outputs of your, the, the, all those qubits need to be um, classified into zeros and ones because the qubits doesn't actually tell us zeros and ones then that uh, typically those zeros and ones would also then be um, uh, grouped into like the histogram, the, into the counts for different bit streets. Then if there's any um, error mitigation that needs to be done, then there's post-processing that also needs to happen. Finally, the results need to be packaged, sent back to your loved, and unpackaged into the Python object. Right. So there's actually a lot of stuff that's going on. I think sometimes you think like you write your code and you just like press a button and then it goes off to the quantum computer, but there's a lot of stuff that actually has to happen. It feels like magic, that. but really it's <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> a lot of hard work from many people on the quantum team. <laughs> For sure, definitely a lot of people, yeah, with their hard work, yeah. It's not just Jesse not just like it's plugging like in Jessie. wires really quickly. <laughs> She's there in like underneath the quantum computer making sure Jesse is the runtime. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I think that was basically our questions. I think that's all we have. But I did have one, what maybe one last question. Um, what would you say to somebody who has a background similar to yours? You know, they have like a classical programming background, but they're interested in getting involved in quantum programming or design. What advice would you give to them? And, and why would they want to get involved in the first place? Yeah, and why might they be interested in getting involved? Sure. So I guess the first advice is don't feel intimidated, because that's what people usually feel when they get into a new field. 
but it is a very exciting field because it's uh, changing rapidly. So if you're interested in learning something new and you know just being part of the cutting edge, being a part of the history even, then that's definitely a good place to be. And also that our utility paper last year improved, uh, has proven that it's not just a theory anymore. We have actual utility uh, scaled quantum computers that people can use as part of their workload. So definitely something that will um, be more possible in the future. So that's a good reason that you want to uh, know about it now. So the time to act is now. The time, <laughs> to, act, the time to act was actually five years ago. But, <laughs> but, but now, year, but the second best time is now. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The, fir the first best time was five years ago, and the second best time is right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you for coming into the city and talking with us. Thank you both. Thank you again so much, Jesse. I always learn so much from her and the rest of the product team whenever I get a chance to talk to them. So um, just a quick couple announcements here at the end before we wrap up. The first is that the IBM Quantum Spring Challenge is launching soon. It's going to be focused on the updates to Qiskit 1.0. So if you haven't updated now, now is the time. Um, and Qiskit 1.0 will be the focus of that challenge. So it's going to teach you how all of the code has changed. And it's basically going to walk you through all of those changes and show you how Qiskit is more performant than ever before. So definitely register in the description below and come and join the community and compete. We also have a couple of new blogs that have just been released on the Qiskit section of the IBM Quantum blog. The first one is all about a Qiskit ecosystem project called M3, which is a really useful tool for measurement error mitigation. The second blog is all about ISA circuits, which stands for Instruction Set Architecture Circuits, which is essentially a way for you to translate your circuits from something into something that uh, is runnable on your target device. Uh, so if you have any confusion about this new um, type of circuit, go check out that blog that should clear up any confusion you have and we'll leave all the links in the description. Yep, all the links are in the description. And as always, if there is anybody you would like to see us interview or hang out with in the studio, drop us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it for us.